So now we get to the space arcs that are activating all over the Earth and on the Moon. That these 24 civilizations left these giant arcs with the advanced technology that would benefit humanity. That these arcs had multiple functions and I'll go through the different functions and I identify four functions later on as I get to the end of the webinar, I'll go through each of the four functions. But one of these functions was to be a repository of advanced technologies that would benefit, that would benefit future generations. So when you would have the seeding of, of a new civilization, these technologies would be there to be shared. So JP has uh, visited some of these uh, ancient space arts, as I mentioned earlier, beginning in 2014. Uh, he was taken to these hemisphere-shaped uh, structures in space and elsewhere. Huge structures holding animals, plant life and ancient technologies. And arts to be used for a future time when humanity may have to evacuate Earth. And that's important. May have to evacuate. It's not inevitable. But that was a possibility back in 2014 when he was telling me this for the first time and I was taking notes. So JP told he would be one of those helping people prepare for life on the arcs. And you know, go back to that audio clip I played earlier from Dolores Cannon where she described people that would play the role of the intermediary with the rest of the humans from particular areas to comfort them and to instruct them so that they could go onto these space arcs that would appear all over the Earth. So JP is one of those people. And what that means, I'll get to talk a little bit more about that soon. Now JP's been on a number of covert missions. He's been on covert missions to Ganymede where he saw some of the ancient extraterrestrial technologies that were left there. He didn't see an arc, or didn't specify seeing an arc on Ganymede, so that, but he did say he saw an arc buried on the moon. And so there's an article on exopolitics.org where he describes a joint US-China mission sent to this alien spacecraft that was discovered by China's rover U-2-2 once the arc began activating. And he said that he went inside of this arc, it was, uh, Russia, uh, sorry, it was uh, Chinese and Americans. He was providing escort duties for an archaeologist that was studying and taking photographs of the writing on the walls. And the writing was uh, hieroglyphs. You got to, s it looked something like Egyptian, it looked, it looked like Mayan. He actually described different hieroglyphic writings in the Ark and someone sent me something. This is um, a gal named Mary Beaver who says that she has been working with the Phoenicians for some time and she sent me this script and I sent it to JP and said, hey, do you recognize this? And he said, yeah, that's, that's what I saw on one of the Arks. So there's validation that this is actually a form of ancient Phoenician and so script that, that was uh, recognized by JP. JP's second official ARC visit, this is part of a covert multinational mission that he was part of, was to an ARC at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean in the vicinity of the Bermuda Tri Triangle. So this was found under the Atlantic Ocean and the US and China cooperated in that mission, it was uh, designed to find out what, what exactly was in this arc because China was being encouraged to share their, techno te their technology that they were finding on the arc on the moon and also ancient repositories in China itself, ancient pyramids in China. I'll, I will talk a little bit more about that later. So the Chinese 
are being encouraged by uh, the US covert branch to share their technologies. And so this is why the US gave access to China to enter the Atlantic arc. So this is what JP said. Because of the Chinese, they let us go on the moon and because they helped us investigate that ship, now we have to let them investigate the one we found here in the Atlantic. It is a deal that we made with the Chinese that you know all if we that you know all. If we go over there now, we let you go on this massive ship that we're going to do the mission with. And it started this, you know, start this mission. So that's JP saying that China is cooperating with the US in exploring some of these arcs that either China or the US has gained access to. And one of the things about China is that there are dozens of pyramids in Shaanxi province that contain ancient technologies that date back before the Great Flood. Uh, I've done a webinar and in my book Rise of the Red Dragon I basically say that these pyramids are not mausoleums, which is the modern explanation for these pyramid-shaped structures in Shaanxi province. There are dozens or even hundreds of these. They are actually antediluvian structures that were built there to house ancient repositories of technologies. So the Chinese know this, uh, the US military knows this, and so the Chinese have not shared this technology. They've kind of hoarded it, prevented Western scientists from going in. From going in, because China wanted to use that for their own secret space program. So, with this ARC mission, uh, JP says that these Aztec Mexicans, who were also part of the, of, of the mission, recognised the writing on the ARC. JP said... We see the lights of the algae like all around the place and then the little Mexicans, they started pointing at the wall on these kind of writings that were f they were familiar with. So we went over there with them and they were like touching it and they were like crying and happy. They were like almost dancing because they saw this particular writing. I think it was part of a missing writing on their temples of Mexicans or one of these Aztec writings that they were like really looking for. In other words, this is Aztec prophecy. The Aztecs prophesied that one day in the future, the founders, the, those that established the Aztec civilization would return and they would bring with them, the gods would come back. And this is what the Aztecs were so excited about when they read the writings on the ancient arcs because they recognized that the time is now at hand, that the cedars, the extraterrestrial civilizations, the 24 ET civilizations, are coming back. That's why they were celebrating. Because this is prophecy being revealed and being satisfied. So he went on. JP said, there are some things that were activated when I got there. So and I asked him, tell me about that. Well, you know, when you arrived there, things began to activate. So JP said, yes, things began to light up when I was like with certain people. With certain people, go, no go, lights turn on. But when I go, when, but when I went, certain lights came on and they were like, what the hell? It was weird, but it was a good feeling. It was certain lights on the walls that were not on and they glowed when I arrived. What JP is saying then is that essentially... The arcs respond to the genetics of visitors. If you have the right genetics, the arcs begin to activate. If you don't have the genetics, then they stay dormant and you can't access the technologies. So it's all about the right genetics. So JP said that he witnessed a spherical ball of light or plasma in the Atlantic arc. And he said that this ball of light or ball of liquid or plasma was really a portal and it was a portal that connects all the arcs in the solar system so you had soldiers from the moon arc coming through this arc and that was part of a rescue mission that JP was part of um, in his second Atlantic arc mission 
and they they were being rescued. So so in the fur so in the Atlantic Arc, in one of the chamber areas, there is this huge ball of kind of liquid plasma suspended, floating in the middle of the room. It's quite large, and it's a portal to the other arcs. So this is a kind of interdimensional travel device, and it connects all the arcs. Now JP has said that there are nine arcs, space arcs on the Earth, and yeah, he's gone through some of these publicly. Others I get to talk about for the first time today. Uh, Antarctica, Lake Vostok. I'll shortly mention what he has to say about that and what others have said about Lake Vostok. Uh, Russia in the north, Ukraine. I've already spoken about uh, Ukraine in my last webinar uh, and in my articles that there's a arc in this area just east of the city of um, Kherson in Ukraine called Oleshki Sands National Park. Uh, Central Europe, Brazil, Talos Novas Mountain State Park, which is not very far from when JP had his first extraterrestrial experience back in 2008. So there might be a connection there. Well, actually, I think there probably is a connection, but I thought that was very interesting. Of course, the Atlantic Arc is also an arc in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, due west of Vancouver Island, that I'm trying to confirm. Um, and also White Sands missile, missile Range. I've been approached by someone who says that she's been having visions of being in an arc in, in White Sands. And that was very interesting because I hadn't put out this information from JP before. And so that is more corroboration that in fact White Sands is a place where this... And you can see the shape. White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Those are the coordinates that JP gave me for the arc buried under White Sands. So it's a sandy area. So because of radiation from the arc, uh, vegetation can't grow. It, it impacts that vegetation above it. So this is why uh, you, you don't have much growth there. A similar thing in... Uh, Caldas Novas State Park in Brazil. Uh, this is a plateau in the municipality of Caldas Novas uh, in the, I guess that's a province, Goiás, or is that a city? Not sure. Uh, and it's called the Structural Dome of Caldas. That's very interesting. In, in Portuguese, it translates as the Structural Dome of Caldas. That's very interesting that somehow the name of it is suggestive of this dome or a arc buried underneath it. Again, these are the coordinates that JP gave me. And here you have Oleshki Sands uh, near Kherson, Ukraine. And this is a desert area. Once again, JP explained that no vegetation grows there because of the radiation over the years being emitted by the arc. And those are the coordinates he was given to me. Now, the conventional explanation is that there's no vegetation there because of sheep overgrazing. Well, I think that's nonsense. JP's explanation makes more sense. And I wrote an article, is the discovery of the ancient ark driving the escalating Ukraine conflict? And this is an important geopolitical prize behind the scenes. So anyway, so that is a little bit of a background about the space arcs that JP has been exposed to or that he's shared information about. So now I want to spend a little bit of time looking at this space arc in the Antarctic area. Now, is an ancient space arc at Lake Vostok heating up Antarctica? So I wrote an article where I release some information I got about a space arc being located at Lake Vostok. And in the title of the article, you see those two graphics, you can see a map of Antarctica with the lake in the blue. And then on the right hand side, you see this thermal image of Antarctica that shows a really big heat dome over this 
East Antarctica region being centered over Lake Vostok. So is there a connection? Uh, reports of ice melting under South Pole first emerged in, in November 2018. This is an article that appeared in Mysterious Universe. And it talked about some scientific studies that showed that a large melt-off was occurring under the ice in Antarctica because there was a, a mysterious radioactive heat that couldn't be traced. So this is, this is the recent heat map showing this massive heat dome or this heating up of Antarctica by as much as 70 degrees. I mean, that's enormous. That's baffled scientists. That is suggesting something really fundamental is, is happening right now in East Antarctica because I've, I've written a book called Antarctica's Hidden History and in Antarctica's Hidden History I talked about West Antarctica where you have these 137 submerged volcanoes that are heating up West Antarctica that's leading to a massive melt-off. So I wasn't aware at that time that something similar was happening in East Antarctica, but it's not because of submerged volcanoes, it's because of these extraterrestrial technologies that are heating up. So Lake Vostok is the epicenter of the heat wave. So this is the Washington Post story describing it. The average high temperature in Vostok at the center of the eastern ice sheet is around minus 63 minus 53 Celsius in March, but on Friday the temperature leaped to zero, minus 17.7 Celsius. The warmest it's been there during March since record keeping began 65 years ago. It broke the previous re monthly record by staggering 27 degrees. So it beat the previous high by 27 degrees. So something is happening in East Antarctica especially over the Lake Vostok region. Now what's interesting about Vostok is that this is the location of a large Russian Antarctic base, Vostok Station. And it was first established back in 1957. Uh, but a new base is being set up as we speak. I think it's going to be deployed by 2023, but the Russians are building a new base over Vostok. So why are the Russians interested in Vostok again? Why the new base? Obviously very, very expensive. Why are the Russians going to this effort to do this? Well, there is this mysterious object at one end of Lake Vostok, which is two miles beneath the surface of Vostok. The, the, um, the plateau at Vostok, where the, the Vostok station is beneath that, under two miles of ice, you have Lake Vostok. And at one end of that Lake Vostok, Lake Vostok is several hundred miles um, in width or length. You can see it's a very large lake. But at, at one end of Lake Vostok, there was a magnetic anomaly identified back in 2001 that is roughly 50 miles in width, which is the size of a city. And so I first began to talk about that. So, uh, so that was first talked about that uh, about in 2001 by Richard Hoagland and Mike Berra in a article that they wrote. And I talk about that in this article here. You can, if you want to get the sources. Go to this article where I talk about uh, Hoagland and Burroughs' information about Lake Vostok and the magnetic anomaly likely being an ancient city. So that's uh, Lake Vostok. So this is where another contactee becomes very relevant. This is a someone I've known since around 2019. Uh, we've met on several occasions. We first met in, in Montreal in Canada at a conference I went to and then uh, he flew out to Hawaii and we got, we got to spend a lot of time and I got to see a lot of documentation. He got to talk about his story. You know, I, I vetted him. And what I found is that Jean-Charles Moyen is essentially the real deal. 
he is someone that has been having contact with extraterrestrials since his childhood. Very important witness, in my opinion. So I did, I've done several, uh, two interviews with Jean Charles. The first interview where he got to talk about his 20 uh, and back program, uh, that was released on December 26th. And a second interview where I followed up with him and David Rousseau, another contactee who verified that he was part of a French secret space program with Jean Charles. So two very important contactees that not only corroborate that there's a French secret space program that's run in conjunction with the US, but that also extraterrestrials are working with this joint French-American secret space program. So this is what Jean Charles said about his visit to the, uh, to the Vostok Ark. Quote, I found myself in the same place under Lake Vostok, but this time I was inside a structure. It was the Ark. Everything was purified inside. No screws, no bolts, nothing. It looked like tungsten, but translucent. I was in the center, and in the middle there was a kind of sphere which turned very luminous. They would have said a ball of bluish plasma which gave off a lot of heat by emitting a crystalline noise and around it was laid out on a geometrical form resembling a star, tubes in which there were beings in stasis. So a couple of things there. First is that this matches what JP says he saw during the second visit to the Antarctic, to, sorry, to the, to the Ark under the Atlantic Ocean, that he saw this spherical blue ball in the middle of one of the chambers there, and it was a portal to other arts, and soldiers were coming through it, or were trapped in it, and then had, had to be rescued and were pulled out. And he also saw kind of like crypt-like tombs, but he didn't know what was inside them. Well, according to Jean Charles, these tubes contain beings in stasis. Giants, if you like. So, Jean Charles continued, I approached one of the tubes, and when I approached, it reacted by lighting up, as if my presence triggered it. I felt in connection with the material of the vessel. The structure seemed alive. I could see the appearance of the being in the tube. He was tall, and his skin had bluish reflections. He was wearing a kind of midnight blue suit without any seams. There was a symbol on the suit representing a triangle with a constellation inside. So this was very significant because here he's talking about a being in a kind of a, a tube or a crypt-like structure, if you like, and that it was activated as he approached. Again, this whole idea that if you have the right genetics, the arts respond to you. And he had the right genetics, and it responded to him, it began to activate. And that there was some sort of connection with this being in the blue suit. So, now this is where we have another dimension emerging here with this trip to Lake Vostok, to the Ark at Lake Vostok from Elena Denard, because she says that she could confirm this. She actually travelled with Jean Charles to the Vostok Ark. Elena said, I was really there, and with him. And I remember now. But he was meant to be the one to remember first, because as Thorhan always says, remembering is activating. So now we can confirm about Lake Vostok. So there you have two people that say that they have been to the Ark in Lake Vostok. And Thorhan said in a message, the Ark under Vostok Lake is part of a much larger structure of halls and temples. A powerful pyramid generator is also there. None could activate it yet. Okay, so that's the Vostok Ark, and that there is a complex, a very vast complex there in Lake Vostok. Remember the magnetic anomaly that I mentioned was like 50 miles in diameter that Hoagland and Barra thought was actually a city back in 2001? Well, here, Forehand is telling us that in fact it is. It's a vast complex of halls and temples and an ark all in that area there under Lake Vostok. So incredible discoveries await us and 
Russia is in the driving seat in terms of who controls access to the Vostok Ark. Very important. So JP now says that there's a connection between the Ukraine, the Atlantic, and the Vostok Ark. So he got to do... He, he left me a voice message, and it's very short, and you get his take on this connection between the Ukraine, the Atlantic, and the Vostok Arks. How can I put this... Here we go. Oops. Let's play that. How can I put... Oops. How can I put this? Um, the Atlantic Arc and the Ukrainian Arc were activating it in the same time. So the Russians are activating over there and we are activating it in the Atlantic in the same time. We're trying to grab information over there in Lake Vostok Arc. So how can I put this in an example? Um, you know when you have okay um, a battery that has a positive and negative, and you put a metal on top, and the battery gets hot. So these other arcs are activating and heating up the arc in Antarctica because we're activating it. So it's like they're connected. This is so quantum entanglement um there's a lot of quantum physics in, into this and it's really interesting how all these arcs are connected so there's jp telling us about the connection between the vostok atlantic and the ukraine arcs and, and Russia is involved, as is the US, as is China. So it gives us an, another perspective on what is happening right now in Ukraine. That, be, that you have the surface reasons that everyone is debating right now in terms of what, what they're fighting over in Ukraine. But if this information is accurate, and of course I believe it is, then there's a deeper reason for what is really going on in Ukraine right now. It's all about who controls access to these arcs and the technologies within them, which are incredibly important for the future. And Russia wants to be sure that it has a powerful voice in, in terms of how these technologies are shared and exploited. So here we have more information about the activating space arcs. And this I find really fascinating. And this is where you actually become part of the story now because are you an incarnated human who is actually one of the crew members of these space arcs? Fascinating possibility. Well, this is something that's discussed in a message that Elena Danan put out. And that's the, the source there on YouTube, on her YouTube channel about the activating space arcs and the awakening starseed cr uh, crews. So this is what was said in that video. Una, and I believe Una is a, is a member of one of the 24 civilizations, and I think that was the Altean civilizations, the, the progenitors of the, of the Atlantean civilization. If I'm wrong, Elena can correct me on that in the chat. So Una said, they buried space arcs below the ground and deep under the waters and in many other places in this star system. They archived all things to create Hall of Records, archiving the knowledge of their own worlds and times gone by on this planet when they had colonies here before the Great Wars and the Exodus. The sleeping arcs gently awakened as the visitors came back, ready to fly when the moment comes. Okay, so what we have here is that not only do you have space arcs that are equipped with these advanced technologies and the capacity to take a lot of people off planet to survive planetary catastrophes and emergencies, but also you have these halls of records. That these were ways in which the repositories of ancient knowledge could be stored for a time when humanity would be ready or when they would be rebuilding a civilization after an earlier one had collapsed. So Una went on. 
The many of us who have taken body on this planet are awakening. The technology we left there is activating, for our ships are back. The crews of the ancient arcs have been sleeping in Terran bodies, waiting to be activated. They are now waking up, and they will revive the sleeping giants. Whoa, just think about that. That is amazing information. That in these arcs, there are these sleeping giants. And those sleeping giants are hibernating, and they part of their consciousness has been projected into into our civilization and they are part of the incarnational cycle waiting for a time when the arcs would be activated so these sleeping giants have been in hibernation for thousands of years and they've been in a part of the incarnational cycle so how many of us this audience i don't know how many how many hundreds are here how many are star seeds who actually are connected to these sleeping giants. Fascinating possibility that Una is raising here. And then we have the space arts and the halls of records. Una, the secret halls of records such as Giza and Bushegji, Bushej, that's in Romania, are not arts, but these places preserve the same technology. They are being unveiled and soon their doors will open and the wisdom so long hidden will be available to all Terrans because I can now finally I can finally I can now finally understand it because now a great extraterrestrial evil has left the planet and humans of Earth are now free to step into their sovereignty, overcome the human minions of the defeated enemy, and unite together to build the most magnificent and prosperous future. So this is telling us about the the halls of records being these repositories of ancient technologies that is going to be revealed to the rest of humanity because now we've reached a point in our civilizational development where negative extraterrestrial factions have been driven off planet and now we are in the final stages of removing from power their deep state minions. Those that are connected with the ruling elite that have controlled us because as this information comes out and becomes mainstream there's not going to be much mercy or sympathy for the deep state or their minions that kept this from us for so long and as the minions of the deep state or of the negative extraterrestrials are removed from all influence all of this information can come out and truly will be a, a golden age. Now this is where we get another source. I, I got to do an interview recently with uh, Peter Moon, the editor of the Transylvania Sunrise series uh, that was published, uh, the English version was, was published uh, by his uh, company and it talks about this Hall of Records in, in the Bushej Mountains in Romania. And so this is how it looks. Uh, this is a graphic that Angelica created uh, for, for the video, for the trailer, and it shows this hemisphere-shaped arc. So it's not an arc, it's actually a hall of record. But it has a similar technology to the arc. Under the Bushej, Bushej mountain, where you have above it, you have a, something called the Sphinx, and something called, um, I think it's called the Babel, which is translated as the Old Ladies. And this is directly over this ark that was uh, discovered uh, by the US military using ground penetrating radar in 2003. And that's when the Romanian intelligence service was con contacted and a joint mission was sent in 2003. And when they found this, uh, the Americans arranged for the Ukrainians to be, so for the Romania, for Romania to be fast tracked into NATO. So it gives you another perspective on what NATO is. You know, the, the so called Eastwood expansion is it, is the Eastwood expansion of NATO just to threaten Russia? That's what a lot of critics of NATO th think, and that's what I certainly was thinking. But now that I've learned about this, it's like, wow, 
Maybe the eastward expansion is so that the US could get control over these East European countries. And, and remember, uh, JP said that there's an arc buried somewhere in uh, Europe. We don't know yet where that is, but this helps explain NATO's rush to expand eastward. They want to get control over all of these submerged technologies. So this, this is another diagram in the Transylvania Sunrise showing this hemisphere-shaped hall of record under Bushedge Mountain. Um, here's the layout of this area and it has tunnels to the inner earth, to Egypt, to Tibet, where there are also halls of records. It has uh, projection chambers, or a projection technology that, that shows historical ages, that have gone by. These are historical records. Uh, you have around the side you have these uh, uh, tables that have holographic tables or they have these tables that create these holographic, holographic projections of historical events going back. Uh, and that object in the middle, sorry, that was actually a time travel device. So in the Egyptian, in, in the, I think this is uh, book three in the Sun, uh, Transylvania Sunrise series, Mystery of Egypt, it talks about a hall of records in Egypt, buried underneath the Sphinx. And so this describes the hall of record. I mean, if you haven't read Transylvania Sunrise, I highly recommend it. You, you need to read that series of books. Not only does it have a lot of information about extraterrestrial technology and about the ancient history of humanity, but it has a lot of philosophical and spiritual information that you need to be activated, to be ready. Because this is all about preparation. Everything that is happening right now, all of us, is all unfolding in a timetable. Everything that is being experienced by all of us, this webinar itself, the information I'm putting out, everything we're learning, is all part of an unfolding, and you're part of that. So I think this Transylvania book series will help you. Now, in this Hall of Records, which is really fascinating, is that you see the walls around this chamber are filled with, the, it's described, 10,000 cylinder-shaped stones that... that each one was a holographic record that would play for two days that would play out historical events. Fascinating historical account of humanity's true history. And this is something that will come out. <clears throat> so who built Egypt's Hall of Records? So Radu Cinema, he is the main protagonist in the... or one of the main protagonists in the... Transylvania book series, he says, I can tell you almost for sure that they are very advanced extraterrestrial civilization who want to help mankind very much. The difference between them and the extraterrestrial civilizations with, with which the Americans have concluded a kind of agreement is about the same as the difference between Homo sapiens and Homo erectus. What's even more troubling is that they're not from our galaxy, but from a galaxy which is very far away. So, what he's describing here is exactly what we are told about the 24 extraterrestrial civilizations that Elena Denan has been talking about, that was mentioned in the Council of Nine information that was relayed by Phyllis Schlemmer, that you have 24 extraterrestrial civilizations who are at the apex of these genetic experiments, not only for Earth, for our solar system and our galaxy, but other galaxies as well. And this matches that. And th that they are an order of evolution ahead of the extraterrestrial civilizations that reached agreements with the US military. So we're talking about the Draco Reptilians, the Orion Alliance, the Greys, that the 24 civilizations are much more evolved than them. So this is another confirmation that these 24 civilizations or the intergalactic confederation 
are very highly involved and they're playing a key role in what's happening on Earth at the moment. So this is where we get some more information about the Ark, sorry, about the Egyptian Hall of Record from Jean Charles. And he says that there's a portal connecting the Vostok Ark and the Egyptian Hall of Records. Very interesting, so let's see what he has to say. So this is an email he received on, uh, I received it on, on April, and yeah, April 1st. Last night I found myself back on the Ark in Antarctica. I was with Victor. I approached the blue sphere of light in the middle of the Ark. JP experienced the same thing uh, in, for the Atlantic Ark. Victor said to me, we have to go somewhere else. It's important. I instinctively raised my hand towards the sphere and I was sucked in by the light and I felt thousands of hot needles going through me with a dizziness and we found ourselves in another ark. I knew I was in Egypt and Victor said to me, we are in another ark, precisely under the Sphinx. So there's a connection between the ark in next to Lake Vostok and the Egyptian Hall of Records. And this is where Elena Danan comes in because she says she's been taken to the Egypt's Hall of Record at least two times. Could be three times. She said she was officially taken there once because she was a, a, a professional archaeologist for 20 years and she spent, I can't remember exactly how many years it was, seven years in Egypt, maybe longer than that, working in different archaeological sites, but she was, she said she was once taken by Havi, Havi Zawas into an underground chamber and at a certain point she had to leave, but she was taken by him towards what she felt was the Hall of Records. But that she was taken at least once, I think twice, as I recall, by Thorham, once as a child and another time, I think it was 1991, by Thorham to the Hall of Records under the Egyptian Sphinx. So there's another connection there uh, between what Jean Charles is experiencing and the Hall of Records under the uh, Sphinx in Egypt. So more information about that is going to be coming out shortly and I'm going to be doing a lot more research on this. This is going to take another deep dive looking at all of these halls of records, their connection to the arcs. I might have to do another webinar just to kind of go deeply into this, especially as the information from Elena and Jean Charles is dynamic. It's happening right now. I'm getting updates all the time and, and trying to put all this into a big picture is takes a bit, quite a bit of work and connecting it to everything we've heard so far. So this takes me now to the big reveal. So I'm probably going to take about another 15 minutes, so we're going to have quite enough time for um, the, the, the questions at the end, end of this presentation. So now the big reveal. So what is the big reveal? This is when these arcs start to publicly emerge. And there's no, it's no longer a question of, well, you know, does extraterrestrial life exist? It's like, it's right there in front of you. So, what is the big reveal? So this takes me to the primary function of the Ark. So that's a question I received before the webinar. And I thought it was something I needed to really spell out. Because as I understand it, there are four primary functions of these Arcs. And I've kind of explained this a little bit here and there during this presentation, but I want to kind of spell it out in detail now so there's no confusion. So the first function appears to be one of a planetary evacuation. So you provide space refuge during times of global catastrophe. So you heard the clip from the Dolores Cannon, the convoluted universe. That's an explanation of how these arcs operate during a time of catastrophe. So will a solar flash happen, a micronova happen, Ben Richardson, Corey Good have been like just insistent that solar flash, solar flash, micronova, that's going to happen. Is it going to happen? Forehand information is no, it's not going to happen. But it's like, okay, like anything, we've got to be open to all possibilities. So one of the functions of these arcs is if something like this were to happen, 
it would be pretty much as Dolores Cannon described it in Convoluted Universe. You would have these arcs appearing all over the Earth. It wouldn't be just one, wouldn't be two or three, it would be dozens, if not hundreds, all over the planet. And people that were ready would go into these arcs and spend time in them. And, um, and then when the Earth recovered from this cataclysmic event, a solar flash, micronova, earth changes and so forth, the arcs would come back. Maybe decades, maybe hundreds of years later. But the people on those arcs would have experienced only a day or two. Quite amazing. So planetary evacuation. If nations compete and go to war over control of arcs, this will precipitate a planetary catastrophe. So I think this is one of the, the functions of the arcs. This is the interconnectedness of the arcs is a fundamental part of their mission, of their function. Because if the different nation states go to war for control over these arcs, and that results in a third world war, well, clearly that's going to be very similar to the last days of Atlantis, as described by Plato, who said that just before Atlantis was submerged by the Great Flood, it, it was embarking on these wars of conflict or on these wars of aggression all over the world. What sparked these Atlantean wars of aggression? The Atlantis were probably similar, or were probably in a similar function or in a similar position to the United States today. The dominant power on planet Earth, they find that there are these arcs all over the planet, so they la launched these wars of aggression. And that precipitated the planetary collapse. So is that what's going to happen with Ukraine? Is that a herald of a planetary collapse because it's going to be a third world war? Or is this just kind of like a, a show to wake people up? Because behind the scenes, Russia, China and the US are collaborating on the exploration and the scientific understanding of these arcs, as JP has been saying. So, is that's the question. Is, is World War III coming, or are we going to have a Great Awakening? The Cedars are part of this Great Awakening. They're working with the Earth Alliance. Of course, the negative extraterrestrials have been working with the Deep State, the Luciferian Alliance. Their goal is to create chaos and create a third world war. Who's going to win? That is being determined right now. Right now, we are at the cusp of a great awakening or planetary disaster. And of course, we are all here, and I'm sure everyone who is watching this, we are all here because we incarnated, because we want to go through this planetary awakening. We are bringing our genetics, our higher consciousness, our starseed lineage and heritage. We're bringing everything we can to help this planet evolve. So I think this brings us now to the second function of the arcs, because it doesn't have to be catastrophe, it doesn't have to be a, a, a war. The second function of the arcs, a planetary awakening, a graduation. So this is where humanity is gifted with advanced technology for a fourth density or fifth density Earth and joining the galactic community. So this is, this is the scenario that's described in the Transylvania series. I think it's also part of the prophecy that you have in the uh, Mayan and the Aztec Indians that the that the builders, the star, that the cedars would return and they would usher in a new age. So this is a time of prophecy. A time when the return of the cedars leads to humanity not collapsing in a, a global catastrophe or in a, or in a thermal nuclear war, but in an awakening where all of these ancient technologies are revealed and the extraterrestrial cedars expose themselves. And we move into a golden age. So the evolution will be very, very rapid once this happens. So this is, I think, the second primary function of these arcs and these halls of records 
is to help us move forward in this graduation, a planetary graduation. So this is why I think it's so important that the information I'm getting from JP that Russia, the United States, China and other countries like France are cooperating in exploring and sharing information from these arcs. So even though on the surface there appears to be like, you know, never, we, we seem to be on the verge of a third world war, beneath that there is this great cooperation because the Earth Alliance, because what we're seeing on the surface is really the deep state driven mass media trying to convince us that we are going to have a third world war. But that's just the deep state control over the mass media. But in reality, the Earth Alliance, they are ensuring that all of the major nations are collaborating in sharing information and access to these arcs. So that, you know, in the Atlantic Space Arc Rescue Mission, that is where Russia, China and the United States all collaborated. So in one of my past webinars, the Earth Alliance Full Disclosure and the Coming Global Revolution, I talk about the Earth Alliance. I talk about these leaders, each of them working with white hats within their respective countries. Now, this doesn't mean that Trump and Putin and Xi Jinping and uh, Narendra Modi are all good guys and, you know, we should love them because they're working with white hats. You know, they're, they're kind of nationalists. They believe in their countries, but they love their countries. Each one is truly dedicated to their country. And they collaborate because they want their countries to thrive. And they understand that the best way for each of their countries to thrive is to collaborate. Because they know enough that if you go into a war against one another in trying to get control of these access or of these technologies these advanced technologies, it'll be planetary chaos. So that's why they're collaborating. So the White Hats and the Earth Alliance are collaborating. So in this webinar, I talk a lot about that. Now this takes me to the third function of the ARCs. New homes, taking those that don't vibrationally fit into a 4D, 5D Earth to another 3D world for a new planetary cycle. So just imagine, we do graduate as a planet to the 4D world or 5D world. All of the advanced technologies are shared. All of the minions of the negative extraterrestrials, the Dark Alliance, are, are, they lose power. Vibrationally, the planet is going to be much more evolved, much, much higher. We're going to have much more of a love vibration. Because this love vibration, this empathy is, is natural. It's a natural thing to love people and to be empathetic and, and to support people. That's a natural thing. The minions of the deep state and the mass media just focus on getting us to go to war against one another, to dehumanize one another, not to listen to one another, to contrive these false conflicts one another. But in this high vibration, that love vibration is going to be natural. But those that don't fit in, that, that want to fight it out, they, you know, they love fighting, they love war, they love conflict, yeah, they get a high in attacking people. They are going to go to a 3D world, another 3D world. So this is the, the splitting off, or this, this there'll be a, a, a 3D world, and this is where the arcs come in. They will take those that do not vibrationally fit into this 4D, 5D world that's emerging after the planetary graduation. They're going to take them off-planet to this new world, wherever it is. So this brings in this information that um, uh, Elena Danan shared back at the end of uh, 2021 about the cabal leaders going to Antarctica to surrender. Well, they did go. We know that. Multiple sources have talked about the cabal or the deep state minions going to, going to Antarctica to surrender. Apparently, deal was, deals were made. They were given an option of going through the portal in Antarctica to this new world in another galaxy where they, or in another solar system where they could start off again a new, a new Eden, to a new Eden planet. But apparently they've reneged on that. So, you know, they, they're going with their plan A which is to put everything they can into contriving a, 
a third world war. That's what we're seeing now. This again is the third function, new homes for the planetary harvest. So it's not necessarily just that those that don't vibrationally fit in with the uh, 4D, 5D Earth that are going to be taken off planet, whether it's through these uh, portals with the different arcs, or whether it's through uh, these, the space arcs themselves, it's also going to be the, um, the star seeds, that the raw material and the, the convoluted universe that both talk about this planetary harvest, where those that vibrate, not necessarily at a 4D, 5D level, but high, vibrate higher at a 6th density or 7th density or 8th density, that we have beings from 6th, 7th, 8th density who have incarnated on Earth. You know, they, for them, life in a 4D, 5D is not what they came here for. They came here to help us get to a 4D, 5D Earth. But once that happens, they're going to return to their 6D, 7th, or 8th D density homes. So this is this described in the raw material of the convoluted universe. Um, so this is that, this is the, this takes us to the fourth function. So, so the third function was new homes for those that don't fit in to the third density. New homes for those. The fourth function, the fourth function of the arts is taking the star seeds home. Okay, so those that do, that belong to 6th, 7th and 8th densities, that they are going to return home. So this is those that are star seeds and they came to Earth for a mission. Once Earth graduates, they're going to say mission accomplished, uh, mission accomplished and they're going to want to go back. So how will humanity respond? to all of this incredible information that is coming out now. It's all coming out. And it's coming out through webinars like this, through videos and revelations of contactees, uh, Jean-Charles, Elena Danan, Alex Collier, uh, JP's information, uh, my website, exopolitics.org. All this information is coming out from multiple sources. And the thing is, how are we going to respond to all of this? Are we going to respond in this positive way and, and have this incredible awakening? I think this is where we're heading. I think we've reached that point that the deep state, the minions, are doing their utmost to bring about fear and paranoia over extraterrestrials. I mean, just today I posted an article or posted a tweet to this article from Britain's Sun talking about the extraterrestrials being a threat according to newly declassified documents from the Defence Intelligence, from, uh, uh, from the Advanced Aerospace Advanced Threat Identification Program that were just released. They're just doing a they're just releasing all this information out, depicting extraterrestrials as a threat. Because they want us to fear extraterrestrials. They won't, don't want the cedars to show up. They want us to go down this path of a, of a war, a false flag event. But the problem is, for them, is that no one believes their bullshit anymore. No one reads the New York Times or the Washington Post and believes it. No one listens to CNN and believes it anymore. We listen or we watch. And we think, what bullshit? <laughs> what, what crap they're putting out? I mean, who listens to CNN? I mean, I, I go to the Washington Post and the New York Times now, not because I think they're going to give me the truth. I want to say, well, how are they spinning things today? And how many people are doing that? 20 years ago, I was among... I mean, 20 years ago, the vast majority of people would have read the Washington Post and the New York Times. I would have listened to CNN and would have thought, this is the gospel truth. This is what's happening in the world right now. Now... People tune in and think, what, what a load of garbage. Because they get the information from alternative sources such as this, such as this webinar, and I'm sure many of you have your favourite alternative sources. So, I think it's a done deal. I think we are going down this path of a planetary awakening, a graduation, the cedars are coming back, they are surrounding the earth now, vibrationally, we are 
rapidly increasing. Ignore the deep state propaganda through the mainstream media because the amount of love and compassion that is being shared at the moment around the planet is phenomenal. It, it is there. So, I think we are going to go down this path. We're going to be welcoming the extraterrestrial cedars. We're not going to buy into the narrative to depict extraterrestrials as demons or as a threat. They're going to be welcomed. We are going to be awakening as one planetary civilization as all of this history comes out. I think the big takeaway is going to be as we learn about Atlantis, the true history of Atlantis, as we learn about the true history of Lemuria, the true history of Hyperborea, the true history of the inner Earth civilization, as we learn all of that, the one thing that I think is going to happen is this powerful sense of oneness, that we are one people, one civilization, one planetary civilization. And as that grows, we will be ready to join the galactic community. So to get more, uh, what's coming in 2022 and beyond, uh, my last webinar, I talk about some of the things that I think are, are coming down our path. So you can get more information about that. I've got a bunch of other webinars uh, from 20, from last year and, and 2020. Uh, so, you, so I've got a web page for all of those videos. And finally, uh, my book series, Book 7, is coming out. I hope it'll come out by early May. I think early May we'll, we'll have book seven out. It's going to be focusing on some of the information you've uh, been hearing today and go into a lot of uh, detail, a lot of documentation about that. To bring this to a conclusion, I just want to acknowledge my team. I want to acknowledge my beautiful wife, Angelica. I mean, Angelica did a fantastic job with the trailer. For this webinar she did all the video editing for this so I mean this truly couldn't have happened without her so thank you Angelica. Uh, Jazz uh, Marlon he looked after the uh, chat session and, and helped also with the setup of this webinar so this truly is a team effort and and thank you thank you the audience I mean you uh, really give me a lot of hope that the world is waking up and I think we are in for an incredible adventure and I really look forward to being part of this adventure with you and, and thank you so much for your support. And I acknowledge the work you do to promote this information to your communities and to your loved ones and to your families and your workplace. So thank you and aloha. You have been listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.